time to turn our focus straight over to AI, artificial intelligence, and some common myths surrounding this technology. Joining me right now, Ryan Pinnell, CEO and Global Chair at Kaiju Worldwide. Thank you so much for being with us. So obviously there's what people believe and all that. Let's just talk about what Kaiju does. What does Kaiju do? We use predictive AI to build capital markets trading systems and trading products. So we've been using predictive AI for a little over half a decade in the management of private funds. And for about 18 months now, we've operated an ETF right here on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange uh, called DIP, which uh, was the first ETF to use AI completely from end to end to make its investment management decisions. In the meantime, we're looking how AI is evolving. So this is exciting, right? So you have an ETF, you're using AI, it picks the stocks in the ETF and trades right here, dip, people could take a look at that. But that's one of the many things that you do there at Kaiju. How are you seeing the evolution of AI and, and how it enhances abilities to make decisions for your portfolio or anything else for that matter? I think you're really seeing sort of a delineation between generative AI, chat GPT, uh, those types of products, which are using AI to try to create something new, and then the predictive side, so trading stocks, driving cars, flying planes, etc. And uh, I mean, I'm a little biased working on the predictive side, obviously, but one of the key benefits is that we don't suffer from the same challenges that they, they do on the generative side. You know, we don't have a problem with ownership of our training data. We know exactly where it came from and we mm -hmm. paid for it. Copyright infringement isn't something for us. The systems don't hallucinate, etc. Right. Look, a lot of people are worried. I, I think there's so much excitement about AI, right? Best thing since sliced bread. But um, and a lot of kids use it in college to answer some questions for, you know, to get themselves in trouble maybe. But um, the other side of it is, you know, how horrific it could be. Fears, misconceptions. Are you hearing that more or less so lately? And what do you say to that? Well, I think it's important to realize that, I mean, this is part of our collective subconscious. I mean, AI has been around in science fiction for a half a century, it's never the good guy, right? In a movie, it's always the villain. And so mulling around in there, you've got this sense that it can do uh, an incredible amount of harm. But the reality is, it can't do anything that you don't give it permission to do. So if it's been trained or taught to, to trade capital markets, mm -hmm. it can't suddenly decide to sing opera or launch nuclear weapons or do anything bizarre. It's just going to do what you allow it to do. So it's sort of like bad people, right? Sometimes people say there are no bad dogs, just bad training. Um, and in this case, there's no bad AI, it's bad training. Exactly. Is that right? Yes, yes. If, you, if you're reckless and you give it uh, an objective of simply making a lot of money without any guardrails whatsoever, then of course it can also lose a lot of money. But if you force it to remain within a specific investment ideology, it can't go outside of the guardrails that you've placed there. So to your point, as long as you've trained it responsibly and you've applied the appropriate risk parameters, it's not going to get into right. a lot of trouble. What about replacing humans? People don't want that. Some people don't want that. Yeah, I, th I think there's application for it to do that a little bit. Every displacement technology from right. the computer, the car, whatever, has replaced some jobs. Certainly in terms of pattern recognition or data analysis, yes, it's superior. Right. But I don't think you want a machine telling you how you should plan for your retirement. I think it's helpful as a tool to assist the asset manager or the financial planner, but ultimately, you're still going to want to talk to a person at the end of the day. And what about um, the false information, which could be AI, could be social media. I mean, there's so much that goes into that. But th how do we protect against that? Well, that's a really good question. And it's something that generative AI struggles with because there are non-standard data sources that it uses. If it's going out into the internet, then it's there's no single source of truth out there. Unlike, let's say, the predictive AI systems that we build, where price, time, and quantity are not uh, something that we have any discussion about. It just They simply are the correct data. So the mm -hmm. outputs are going to have a higher level of certainty than something like paint me a picture or get my song lyrics or pull all of the 13 Ds and Fs with these criteria and feed them back to me you're not exactly certain that what you're getting is correct. And then for decision making, um, do we use AI for decision making? 
I think it depends on the application. So it's important to acknowledge that what we have an enormous amount of success with in our business is short-term trading. It's, it's one to seven days. Mm -hmm. Predictive AI is highly effective in that kind of time frame, but where a stock is going to be three months from now, six months from now, no, it's not going to be able to do that. It's interesting because we were watching the next playoffs games, right? And so you just talked about short-term trading and trying to pick winners, and you're probably using all kinds of metrics from cash flow to PE and all that. Um, and the question somebody asked when we were watching the playoffs is, why can't I, AI just pick all the winners of all the sports things that we watch? Why, why can't it? I think it would be able to predict outcomes in the moment. So right. Steph Curry receives the ball at the three-point line. There's no lateral movement. It could probably, with reasonable certainty, predict whether or not that ball was going to go in. But tomorrow, whether or not Steph Curry will have a good game or not, there are just too many variables. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about DIP. I mean, when you talk about the trading platform and trying to have AI pick the stocks that go into DIP, do you, I mean, there's obviously some criteria. It must have to be a certain value. I mean, you're not going to put micro caps in there, right? Um, do they have to be U.S. stocks? Are they in a certain uh, category? Things like that. So DIP uh, only act, is active on large cap U.S. equities, mm -hmm. S&P 500 components. It predates on low to high mean reversion in artificially oversold stocks. It performs 2 billion discrete examinations every day before it rebalances at the end of the day. And I mean, it's had a heck of a year so far. When you think about all the companies that are investing in AI right now, um, you know, it, it started with Meta's earnings release and everybody sort of was scratching their head. They just didn't expect so much CapEx spending on AI, but we've seen it from the likes of, of Microsoft and, and all the other companies, Apple. Um, where do you, what do you think about these big companies and how they're developing their own large language, um, you know, platforms and such? Well, I think right now there's an enormous amount of promise to the technology. Whether or not that can actually be delivered is another question. And I think that's where investors are starting to drill in right now. It costs an incredible amount of money to run these generative systems, right. but the revenue model isn't exactly clear so far. Many of them have not articulated a revenue model, and in the case of OpenAI, I mean, Sam Altman just came out and said that his revenue plan was to develop artificial general intelligence and then ask it how to make money. So, uh, you know, the flash and fanfare of last year at about this time, now right. I think you're getting a lot more skepticism and a critical eye applied. Look, I'm not an AI expert, but I, I did hear an interview pertaining to AI, and it was just exactly what you're talking about, chat GPT, and the billions of dollars that go into each level of advancing AI, and that at some point, it just gets priced out. Um, I think we were up to chat uh, GPT 4 or 5, yeah. right? Is that right? Somewhere yeah, four, around five. there? 4 yeah. 5. Is that? So it was, it was just talking about how now you stall out because you need billions and billions of dollars to try to get to the next level. Like, when does that happen? Well, exactly. Right? And I, I, I think that's the real challenge is that because you have to account for any question or task someone might ask. Right. It's, it's this never-ending, all-consuming application where, where you could throw a limitless amount of money on it. Yeah. It's one of the reasons that we okay. really drilled into predictive yeah. AI, because right. it's a much smaller ecosystem right. where you're solving a specific problem. And look, it slows down. It's exactly what the first meetings were, right? You had Elon Musk going to Washington and sort of looking at AI and regulation and AI and slow it down. It's too much, too fast. I mean, just the price tag will slow it down. Exactly. Right? If you're okay. entering like the generative side now and you don't have tens of billions yeah. of dollars, I don't think you can compete. Ryan Pinnell, CEO, Global Chair at Kaiju Worldwide. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much.